again at night. Um, this is a little talk about, um, as we're talking about um, introduction, excuse me, introduction to um, uh, theatrical design, um, technology and performance, how, the, the kind of where we tell stories, um, where we find occasion to stop and listen and have some interest and some concentration, pay for tickets, um, pay to see something magical or something skillful that someone put up. Um, and we, we've kind of lost touch with that in a couple of ways. First of all, through um, 50, 60, 70 years of television, where the um, TV came right to the, the household is something what um, Rick and myself were talking about in this uh, Earl Lear piece. What was the house? The car became the detached room. Um, you went off somewhere. You fought against loneliness by driving your Model T to the next farm on Sundays. Um, the uh, technology, including the washing machine, um, transformed uh, a lot of the way we see public space. Um, uh, this is a, a little ancient uh, theater on a mountaintop in Greece. I think it's near Thebes. Some, I don't think it's from the Mycenaeans, but it is very old. Um, and we come out of a society, secondly, out of COVID, where our public space could infect and kill us. Um, again, I remember that those nights when there were literally 1,200 people dying a night um, from COVID. So we, uh, uh, public space is eroded a bit in our concept, in our sense of importance. We have this, contrast this to this flood of, of Netflix and, um, and Amazon Prime and Hulu and just this copious procedure, pro, procedularity, as what it is called in digital plenitude. Um, so we contrast that to places of procession. The Greeks often made a procession to these places of storytelling, theater. Um, we, um, uh, they often had rites where um, the, the bacchanalia, where women and men um, exchanged positions of power, a little like carnival nowadays. We have remnants of this in society that don't need these screens everywhere, which is also reminiscent of Plato's Republic, the, the, um, uh, the, the illusions, shadows in the cave um, uh, sort of dialogue. So we had these things out in nature, out under the elements, the sky, the um, sometimes are hot sun, they covered them, them over. I've been to a number of these in Delos, in Syracuse, in Athens. Um, they're magnificent. Um, the one is Greco-Roman, I think, in Taormina, and that is absolutely one of the most beautiful theaters in the world, as I said, framing off the volcano. So in this class, uh, studying spaces, and I want you to think about this with a capital S. Where do we go? Where do we go to get our information? Where do we go to get our transformation? Um, who are we depending upon um, to lure us in, to change our minds, to make us feel something, to make us think. Um, uh, the modern 1,000-year-old university also has this sort of uh, a, a, a theatrical presentational sense where students gather in front of a, a declaiming professor, um, which you have scant view of in this asynchronous version. Um, uh, it is um, uh, a transformation, how we trust screens, we uh, do our little text messages while someone is 
declaiming something. Um, one wonders if that was the way for the Greeks and the Romans, the Indians and the Chinese, these ancient societies. Um, the, the, the sort of quest position of shamanic um, humans around the world. One of my favorite interesting one is the Korean shaman, which are usually women. And they go through this initiation, whether they can become, it's called a kut, uh, whether they become um, mediums of, uh, I don't know, I, I can't even begin to know, um, some other world in which they're tasked with communicating that um, with, uh, with the, the community. Um, shamanic also are of the pansri singers of Korea, usually women, who gather in a public place much like this and, um, and continue to uh, 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 sort of declaim their works. I think my photo is throttled if I'm not incorrect this should come back at um, a certain time I have a lot of windows open but we shall proceed um, moving on um, moving on um, so this of uh, 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 performance in the agora the public place the stoa the the marketplace again as I said in my little talk on, um, on how to design a club, why I'm fascinated by stairs, the idea that people sit on stairs and they, they watch things go by. Um, they get elevated over the shoulders of others, um, but it's a position of the voyeur. Um, here in uh, Cistern, the Agora, the temple, coming, interconnecting these aspects of society, we don't quite know how and to what extent the functioning of, um, of a polytheism had, a pantheism, um, had for ancient peoples. There are certain peoples who have that aspect to each um, so-called deity was an aspect of a personality. Um, each one had their temples. Um, it was uh, the rise of monotheism that uh, wanted to challenge and bring together the, the, the kind of wholeness of, of what is divine out there. Much recent criticism of that, uh, certainly um, there's been a lot of spilled ink over this, notably is Freud's uh, Moses and monotheism, the idea that this rigidified of, uh, from Judaism, Christianity, Islam, that there's this rigidified, um, they call the first two are called the people of the book, um, that aspects of personality, aspects of chance, aspects of, of divinity out there, even aspects of nature are countered in um, uh, notions of of other peoples who have shamanic forces, have ideas of pantheism and so forth. But here's the outgrowth from the temple of a person coming to declaim something. It was Thespis who was one of the first actors to portray the illusion of someone else, believe it or not, um, which was very revolutionary. Um, whether or not it was attributed to the Greeks, it's uh, assumed to be um, a Greek thing to decide that uh, they're going to have a character's portraying, um, uh, actors portraying a character. It's difficult to think that shamanic performance and other so-called, um, uh, I hate that word primitive, but earlier, um, performances didn't have this idea of putting on the guise of someone else personas but um, this is the um, uh, official line uh, moving on these places were 
lonely and beautiful and there took a procession to get there. Um, uh, these are in very raw states, but what I like is that they were usually always carved out with an idea of overlooking nature, that nature took a, um, a prominent position in terms of framing um, and surrounding that architecture, um, which was carved out for um, a ma and a radius to maximize the amount of seating, but also to maximize sound. If you've ever been in one of these Greco-Roman theaters, uh, they're magnificent for acoustics. Um, the um, theaters in Pompeii are well preserved and you can actually walk across the stage and speak and, and often the acoustics are arranged so that um, it, I could be using this um, tone and these decibels and, and people um, 20, 30 feet away can um, have the amplification and the acoustics. Um, much like that famous uh, groin vaulting in um, Grand Central Station near the Oyster Bar where you whisper into the wall, try it sometimes. Um, uh, stairs, again, um, looking on to performances, ritually fabricated, um, relating stories of, of from the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Homeric traditions, which um, supposedly, if we're looking at uh, Periclean Greece, roughly in the fourth, century, um, this is, um, uh, we have the Homeric era, of, uh, maybe a 700 to 1,000 years before that. Of course, we had the Bronze Age collapse around the year 1200 um, a, a BC, which is great speculation even now and as to what happened an entire collapse of, of all the Mediterranean civilizations, including three very interlocked societies, the Egyptians, the Hittites, and the Assyrians, um, all had these dependent interlocking, sometimes warring economies, developed bronze, developed the war chariot, um, worked out their technologies. I've seen these war chariots in the Egyptian museums, and they are just magnificent. Um, and that society came to a complete collapse. And this is about the time of these Homeric stories, uh, usually um, recited by bards, uh, uh, poets who memorized these uh, long tracks. And um, they're considered quasi-shamanic roles, to be a bard, to be a poet, to be um, someone who memorizes rather than having it written down. Bronze Age collapse roughly 13, 12, uh, 11 century BC. The explosion of Terra on Santorini caused uh, floods and devastation to Cretan Minoan society. Um, the Mycenaeans were subject of these great Homeric tales of uh, Helen of Troy and the great city of, walled city of Troy, which they did find in the 18th century. Um, uh, uh, so, 19th century, I think. Um, so there were these tales. The tales did have some foundation. Of course, the great uh, writers and uh, patriarchs of the of the um, Old Testament, uh, of the, the Jewish tales of uh, the Pentateuch um, were all there. So how did people, what was the technology they used to um, relate these um, stories in? Let's go further. Um, here's the stairs configuration on a vase painting, people looking out, people reacting to the action they're seeing. Um, a very primitive, very rudimentary, the stairs, the temple, um, a processional um, uh, 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 sort of salutations to whatever god 
was presenting it down front. There was usually left uh, seats for the gods. Um, and um, these were stories of mythology um, and um, Homeric tales, uh, tales we um, uh, 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 later put together in Hesiod and Ovid gathered these tales. Um, these are things people such as Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell go back to and say these, apart from the monotheism, these, these stories allowed one to, um, to come to terms with their own journey and find aspects of the divine out there that mirrored and echoed aspects of the divine within instead of a of a distant and, and, and disapprobative God, one God, or a um, mediator such as uh, uh, Jesus Christ to mediate the, the law and base it on um, kind of a, a suffering, a greater faith. Um, through suffering, um, traces of Buddhism in there too, which makes you wonder. Um, uh, so, and the, the kind of shift in consciousness, um, Julian Jaynes has the, the rise of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind around that time of the Bronze Age collapse into Periclean Greece. Uh, remarkably, four gentlemen did kind of show up, um, similar ideas, Socrates, Confucius, um, Buddha, and Christ. Um, uh, Carl Jaspers has a, a book um, uh, kind of outlining what uh, this consciousness um, tracing was. But these are, these are religious characters. This is theater. This is um, a moral dimension. In some sense, it is secular, even though there was a religious dimension. And the architecture is coming together. Um, it's getting uh, uh, constructed together in sort of these rock structures, a little bit temporary, please excuse the roughness of the photographs here. Um, again, carved into hillsides. Um, there's a famous one in outside of Denver, Red Rocks, which is magnificent in terms of uh, being carved into hillside. There's occasionally, there's places, colleges, <clears throat> what is it, Mount Holyoke has one carved into a hill overlooking a, kind of a globe stage. Um, the, uh, once again, there's a, there's a triumvirate. The architecture, nature itself, the view, the landscape, and human consciousness, all trying to have this three-way dialogue with each other, I contend, uh, especially with architecture as a... As a kind of a new form that's departing from mere shelter. Um, processionals, uh, again, the technology increased the acoustics. Um, there's the omnipresent uh, temple. Uh, at least anyone should forget what to be aware of and have to give ablutions to what sort of gods. Um, uh, there was... Uh, uh, comedic plays, as in Aristophanes. There were, um, and at tragedy means goat song, where they ritually brought a goat out and slaughtered it before um, each play. Um, uh, so there was a sacrificial function to it. Um, very old um, theaters are the, which have remained, um, uh, posts for the periactoi, which they assume they had painted sets on, uh, slotted into these things and were changed. So we see a setting, a background, a design for the stage. Um, reach far into the future where we now have VR out of a gaming culture, flexibility and a sort of inclusion of AI to um, stories, continuous stories. Um, uh, sun would go up in this Greek world and then it would go down and they would have drama all day. Um, so this comes, it's, uh, you can see an architecture unifying, 
we still have the the sacrificial um, stone plinth thing downstage. Um, we start to see sets that resemble other aspects. I don't know if Thespis would be acting on this stage, but certainly at this time, the the temple becomes sort of the stage house, uh, making entrances and exits, um, a vase painting of what that temple house would look like. And there was started to be a, a, a sort of a division between the voyeurs on the outside and the presenters. Um, that division is felt even today, except for uh, various forms that they attempted in the 60s after a, a look again, Breck looked at Chinese theater, um, uh, opera, Beijing, Beijing opera, other sorts of declamatory, declamatory forms and tried to include this in the Western conception of, of presenting as if you are not making an illusion. Um, continuing. Um, so there's a, a chairs for the gods um, downstage. And certainly this theater would be um, that which Thespis would um, start to pretend he's someone he isn't. Um, which was a radical notion. Um, at, to follow Julian Jaynes' idea that there was a shift in consciousness, it is also at this time in Periclean Greece that Socrates, who declaims and um, debates his philosophy without writing it down, it's Plato, his student, who writes it down, has um, a rather... Uh, vigorous attack on the written word, saying it trivial, trivializes truth that we need to store it away, archive it. Um, we strangely have that again, that same flavor going into the notion of um, we, uh, I think it's we double human knowledge or human um, recorded knowledge every three hours, it used to be every three days. It took um, up to 2003 to double it. And then it doubles itself every day and then every hours, the, the amount of information put out there. Certainly these little YouTubes contribute to the, just the, the, the gigabitage or whatever the top to the 43rd um, zeros to which uh, teraflops or um, uh, double this information. So how do we swim through that information? How do we um, present in front of thousands of people now, as you can see, see? How do you enjoy it in the baking sun? How did the powers that be sort of reflect back what a model citizen should be to risk their life fighting a war? create a sense of the otherness, particularly with the Persians. Um, uh, how do we unify all the city-states? If you've read Thucydides, there's wonderful accounts of each personality of each of these city-states, which unified in times of war against Persia, but then disintegrated under the more or less um, Confederate states in a civil war of the Peloponnesian War of Athens against Sparta. Um, Athens, uh, I'm not too familiar what Sparta had in terms of theater, but uh, Athenians really loved it. Um, so we, we now have this, um, uh, the, the theater um, of Dionysus, I think it is, conjoined to the Acropolis is I think this is a rendering of this. We see the skene, the, what would later become the proscenium if it was widened out to a picture plane and made bigger. Uh, Proskenon is the, the place in front of that. Uh, uh, orchestra was a circular pit, often with musicians. Um, Parados was that, uh, I think it's what, uh, where they entered. 
um, on the sides, you say enter stage right, stage left. Um, uh, uh, what else is um, uh, Logion is this double tiered thing um, in the architecture. So now these were important communication devices within the Greek society. Um, kind of like this in the hot sun. Um, rock cut ramp to the Logion. Um, these are big and elegant and had their own mathematics to it. Uh, Vitruvius um, wrote copiously on the construction of theaters, the ideal forms. Um, uh, uh, and then they, they got bigger and bigger. This is, the Romans decided to not just cut them into a hill, even though the, um, the one at Taramina is cut into a hill, but actually make these with their marvelous, marvelous, marvelous engineering, the use of the arch. Um, I think they had the groin vault to um, vaulting, arching, um, the, their marvelous system of, of manufacturing, invention of concrete. They made these buildings freestanding. They're a joy to be in and walk around. I've been in quite a few of them. Um, the ones in Pompeii, a couple of them there are, are favorites. Um, the, as the amphitheater, um, the um, Colosseum is also, where, of course, they had the spectacles, the gladiator, gladiatorial fights, and so on. Um, this is in Verona, Italy. Again, a freestanding Colosseum. Um, the Romans loved their facades, um, considered them units to uh, sort of redoing the Greek skene and, and providing these whole facades. These things would be um, use canvas tarping over the top to protect the viewers from the sun. Um, uh, well-loved, well-used, not as well-loved and well-used as the Colosseums, place for blood sports, gladiatorial games, and so forth. And I guess the number one um, uh, favorite, which is um, a red peripher peripherally, um, they can join it to um, gambling and luck and the sense of the stars were the um, hippodromes, the, the, the racetracks, which were fantastically um, loved. A, a matter of fact, the one in Rome was totally dismantled, um, almost out of a vengeance by the early Christian church to, to have these um, uh, already quarried rocks that they just built most of the, um, the Christian churches inside of Rome from the, um, the uh, uh, stones and marble and ornamentation of the Hippodrome, um, which is, exists as a kind of pit now. Um, and their vaulting was magnificent. If you ever get to Rome and go inside the Colosseum, it's, it's just a marvel. Um, we'll go on to the Middle Ages. The, the, um, that uh, 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 sort of, uh, not attack, but this jealousy of, of the early Christian church, which they had of the theater, kind of a rivalry. Um, these were secular stories, pagan stories coming out of the theater, and so there's a resistance against that, that this would still be in competition, even though some of the, uh, the same stories continued over. Um, <clears throat> these are interesting because these are morality tales worked out in Middle Age medieval morality tales. There's hell over there. Um, to me, these are interesting because they do resemble um, kind of the, the modern breakout room, uh, which is now hugely popular. Um, I think as a reaction to the screen, I guess the top countries that love their little escape room, breakout room, escape rooms are China, which there are hundreds, if not thousands of them in China, Hungary, for some reason, 
Um, and these, these initial medieval theaters had different spatial sections for different aspects of, of storytelling, usually morality stories of, of people um, like every man of, of in the journey of life, doing good life as a metaphor, the trope of the journey as a metaphor um, for being good, doing good, having faith in God and Christ and all these good things um, with the temptations and the uh, 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 challenges on the way. Again, a little drawing of a morality play, spatially set out. I forget, there's a German city and a Swiss city where this still takes place in uh, Amagal. Um, I'm, I'm just, we've got to do research on this. Um, where they take the town square, the piazza, transform it into, again, one of these morality plays. Um, some having a actor portray Christ and the, the, the passion, the final passion. Um, it's on its side, but you can see these town squares um, inhibited by the air or inhabited by these things called wagons, just different stations of the cross brought in and representing ostensibly stories within the New Testament, but um, it took on aspects of personality. Um, when, and here's another one, a morality tale inside a Swiss city, German, I think there was one in Zurich, there was one in, in most of the Hanseanic cities. Um, what do we think of this? Um, we can think from the um, Homeric tradition up until the printing press, which was basically an invention that came over from China and Korea and then reworked um, uh, in Korea, King Sejun, uh, of, of not long after, um, his wood block and metal press block uh, devised a language which he wanted to make his entire kingdom literate, which is a very, they still offer the King Sejun Literacy Award in the UN. Um, we are looking at cultures that, and we can see this competi competition between theater, theatrical forms and religious forms. Um, endless spilt ink and PhDs as to what's the difference between seeing and doubting and seeing and believing. Um, one assumes that um, you see a little Netflix superhero film and you doubt, um, and then you see something religious and you believe. Um, one of the main things to consider in the tradition of the bards and going through um, uh, uh, Socrates um, abhorrence of the written language of archiving this stuff is the big notion of literacy. These were places spatially, visually, orally, musically, and above all publicly to which people got their information um, in, in a time before the printing press. And certainly now, as McLuhan said, we're exiting this uh, linear printed world. Um, uh, he called it the tyranny of the Phoenician alphabet, little lines that give us reality. And now we're entering with the television and movies. He said this new, well, actually he said the light bulb um, gives us these new renderings of information that are non-literal, non-literate, um, do not adhere to the Phoenician alphabet existing in terms of lines and so forth. Um, going further, um, I could spend endless hours going over this. Another morality tale, creating illusions for people representing um, moral zones, religious stories, uh, stations of the cross, the notion that Christ was the mediator between um, uh, a harsh uh, Old Testament God and um, uh, 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 
man's suffering, a human suffering, um, that he, you know, humans have this debt to him for doing this. Now, these stories would retell these, um, the passion, the final stories, the, the, the tribulations in the final year. Um, then we go to the uh, kind of, if we can say that there was still a competition between the religious, what basic, basic illiterate people got for information and then what the courts got, there's a big difference. The courtyards in uh, the palaces assembled at all the learned uh, gentlemen, literate, um, with great facility for um, having read from the um, uh, uh, Homeric uh, epics all the way through their era, often speaking a couple languages themselves. Um, Shakespearean English is uh, complex to our ears because it is somewhat structured like um, Latin grammar. The, uh, we have a very straight jacketed way of using English now, subject, verb, object. And like Latin, like German, the, the subject and the verbs and the objects can jump around in a sentence. Iambic pentameters like a boat bobbing up and down on the, on the ocean. Um, uh, these were learned men. Rick and I contend, we have that little moment in the earlier video, that Shakespeare was a committee. It was a committee of, of, of the best um, brains of, of Elizabethan English, uh, England, certainly Ben Jonson, certainly Duke of, of Cambridge, um, who is reputed to be Elizabeth's, one of Elizabeth's lover. Um, maybe Shakespeare himself, although he was the impresario, he was the biz guy, uh, putting his stamp on everything. Uh, uh, ben Johnson, um, uh, 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 a couple others, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the one, uh, Marlowe, of course, who was murdered in a bar, stabbed to death. Um, uh, some of these people were reputed to be spies, um, closet Catholics, um, uh, atheists. Um, these were interesting thinkers um, in, in their times, and they wrote for the courts. Um, here's the Globe Theater, which was originally a barren bull baiting pit for gambling savagely watching animals kill each other. Um, people bet on it, and then that turned into savage portrayal of violence in Elizabethan and Jacobean theater. Um, one of these famously burned down. One of them was the globe or the swan. They were moved over to the south embankment. Um, Inigo Jones, one of my favorite designer architects, tried to combine the two notions of a theater and a courtyard in a uh, palace. Um, so we have that, uh, that, uh, sorry, that's totally upside down, um, dichotomy between um, the learned, the men of letters, uh, the women of letters, um, Afro-Ben, um, and uh, the common people who went to hear um, uh, at an affordable rate, they had to stand in the middle of this orchestra, um, hear the stories, hear the reworking of the stories, hear stories they already knew the endings of. Um, again, upside down. Um, and that moved outward to this creation. This is actually a modern theater, a Bauhausian theater. Um, I added this section. <coughs> it um, not... Um, atypical, not too strange, this um, main portal in the middle of the stage expanded with the Italian Renaissance, Teatro Farnese, uh, Teatro Olimpico um, took that main position. They were the Greeks used to seat the gods, they sat the prince, 
everyone was adjusting their view to where the prints would look. Um, these spaces opened up and we got basically a big picture window uh, on which, behind which you create an illusion. Um, the, uh, um, notion that, um, this was a window onto an illusory world was something also carried on in painting as I went through in earlier, um, uh, uh, videos. Let's see this further. Um, sorry, sideways. Um, this was of course fractured that big, um, sort of picture plane, painting, um, big window illusion that we see in our Broadway theaters. Bam, we see it at, um, we're conditioned to see this 19th century view basically before movies, but even our movie houses had the big view, uh, the flatness of the flickering film where you could experience and share um, uh, the, the emotions with those around you was fractured in the 60s as people attempted to um, portray the sculptural sense of the bodies in action, in agency, in moral dilemmas, um, kind of maybe returning back to a shamanic aspect. Um, there was a big fandom for um, non proscenium stages, even though the chairs could be aligned that way. And, and hence the, the, the emergence of the black box. Um, SVU has one, most other theaters in the country have one. It's, a, a, I think, a more fun place to design in. Um, going further, into this um, Inigo Jones idea of, of the golden section and the harmonics which guide both the audience area and the um, staging area is there. Um, uh, moving further, this is to complement forced perspectives which give an illusion of depth. Um, perspective was that thing that reinvention it wasn't invented by the Rena renaissance masters but certainly mantegna um, uh, da vinci um, reinvest and um, paolo uccello um, uh, uh, the brunelleschi was the famous one for devising um, cities theaters churches that created illusions with depth and we can see on this one, um, the illusion of depth created in the, the staging and the flats um, uh, to play around with this space. Um, great, give a greater sense of depth. Um, still, the theaters were small, were intimate. Here's Inigo Jones' idea for Renaissance England. They were cold. Um, they were lit by candles, magnified with mirrors. They often burnt down. Um, but people collected publicly um, to watch ideas, to watch secular ideas, as opposed to the magnificent churches that had sprung up already. Um, here's an Inigo Jones, uh, a kind of a little bit resembling a Baroque church. Uh, uh, these tubular circular churches in Rome, I'm thinking of designed by Bramanti and Brunelleschi, uh, uh, not Brunelleschi, but Bramante uh, and, and uh, Borromini um, in Baroque Counter-Reformation Rome. Um, simple English uh, theaters, the English theater. Of course, England was known for its dramatic um, writing certainly the french and germans were also the italians had the commedia dell'arte um dividing up characters uh, stock characters that would show up in each piece much like the stock characters we become because of our um, f uh, cell phones and facilities with TikTok and so forth interesting interesting latitude um with all of these concerns. Teatro Olimpico, one of my favorites, you see that main door getting bigger and bigger and bigger, resembling a picture plane, resembling the new 
scientific idea that the one point perspective was the eye of God looking back at humanity, which is now has a clear path that it can divide and quantify into infinity, which is the vanishing point. Um, great amount of ink spilt on um, what perspective means. I have seen perspective in the baths and some luxury houses in Pompeii. It isn't anything new, um, but um, it was a, a Renaissance trope, a Renaissance Italian trope. Um, here's Teatrical Olympico. The, the, um, the main door is getting wider. We see the Roman Scene, we see going back to that, um, but uh, we see a more or less permanent of uh, detailing and tablature, even though this was made out of wood. Um, it was meant to be taken down, and they never did, um, thankfully. Um, so this was, oh, I love just the simple geometrics of English theater and into the French and Spanish, the golden era of Spanish theater, Calderon, no less morality tales, the rebuilding of the globe, um, uh, which, believe it or not, about 3,000 people could be seated in that. Um, the Globe, um, Globe Theater from the view on the south bank of the Thames, um, or Globe, older Globe, uh, of old rendering of the Globe, um, Teatro Olimpico, Scasmazzi was the um, arch Italian architect. Um, and so we see this interplay, more morality tales, which didn't leave um, Ober Ammergau, I think it is, in Germany, which has been going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years, um, the, the um, Easter tale, the Passion. Um, churches, uh, theaters that resemble churches, but again, consider after all of the amazing work done to churches in Europe, how magnificent these th things are in terms of engineering and um, feats of collective uh, work um, in a largely illiterate society led by the priestly, priestly classes and the, the royalty. Um, we have to remember that this was the churches were a, a type, a form of UBI, universal basic income. They were worked on for sometimes hundreds of years um, uh, by the town that would work on agriculture in this summertime and then keep themselves busy. The Masons, the Freemasons, keep themselves busy with constructing these large economic things. Much of Rome has that aspect of, the church had that aspect of employing people in these fantastic building projects, much like Rome did to keep its um, idle hands busy, um, largely at one point, uh, two thirds to three quarters of Rome were, were foreigners on the verge of rioting. Um, within the Colosseum, they had the breads and circuses um, uh, spectacles of violence, and then the bread trucks would come in and throw loaves of bread up into the audience. Has that really changed these breads and circuses? I doubt it has. Um, so we see these, this thing, this technology, this um, beautiful but primitive idea of giving a collective viewpoint to a collective spectacle, a, coll a way of collectively experiencing something together, um, carried on into the 19th century, certainly the 20th century, when film and television started to rival that, and then this little thing called the internet um, began to rival um, these big public spaces. Um, tiny little screens on your cell phones, annoying those you're riding with trains with your loud TikToks or, or laptop screens where every member of the family is watching what they want to watch. 
um, very different from the Greeks who had to watch um, stories of which the endings they already knew, but in the retelling of the stories, they could have a different view. The, the theaters were like mechanisms, like clocks, like um, bizarre little contrived toys on a grand scale. And um, it's amazing to be inside one of these old Baroque stages in Sicily, for example, um, has some very beautiful Baroque stages. Um, the birth of the opera coincided with the rise of this mercantile class so that the, the audience area became types of, of stages themselves. Um, uh, the upper classes would get the opera boxes on the sides, as you can see here, um, almost like a proscenium arch themselves. Um, certainly, if you read the novel Madame Bovary, she loves the theater to go see her lovers. There are a number of other um, stories about theater being a public place where the newly forged mercantile urban bourgeoisie can work out their little um, desires, trysts, romances, tragedies. Um, in these palaces, these new secular places of spectacle and meaning. This should wrap us up with this um, panoply of, of staging. Uh, that is to give you a, a view, an idea, a context about what we go into. I'm sure other places, other Universities start with the notion of, hey man, let's just talk about the space. What are, what are, what does one go into when one sees a Broadway show? Um, um, usually an old theater started, built, assembled, contrived around 19th century notions. And um, those things have fractured. They, these things remain, especially if you see them in Europe, um, magnificent, but these have been shattered into thousands of little pieces, certainly by the cinema, then by television, where a little box showed up in every house in America, then the world, um, that has forged and changed consciousness. And um, now, uh, in the case of the internet, as McLuhan has this um, famous um, modality um, model of hot and cold medium, he said the, the, the new media that really uh, attracts is cold. Uh, that television is actually a cold medium because they're just little pixelated uh, fibers coming out of the tube, cathode ray tube, um, so that people have to work to see, to be in, it demands attention, as opposed to the cinema, which he said was very hot, this idea of, of bright light projecting through celluloid um, onto a gigantic screen um, was a very hot medium. He has that uh, uh, binary, that dialectic. I've said this class is going to be a class of binaries and dialectics. And certainly um, McLuhan has pointed out dynamics between. McLuhan died in the late 70s, I think, as computers were just coming about. But certainly everyone kept going back to that book, um, Understanding Media, which I do occasionally just to, to understand a very adept articulation in, in kind of Aristotelian binary form of of what each new invention does. He has this concept of the rear view mirror that um, as we go forward, we look into the rear view mirror and in the rear view mirror, there's the previous medium. In the rear view mirror of these little screens connected to the internet is of course television. And in television, the rear view mirror of that vehicle is film. And in film, there's theater. Um, 
very simplified, but um, a very, very great and dynamic book um, that still has its resonance and, and credibility in how he articulated in, in often a, a strange and phenomenological and speculative way. Um, but the, the binary still hold up, the binary relationships he's talking about. That's it for now. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you in the next one.